All right, into our sermon today. Let me tell you the story of Chuck Colson. Chuck was um, the, a special advisor, special counsel to President Nixon. And he was known as Nixon's hatchet man. And his rise to, in, in, through the political uh, system was uh, an unprincipled one. It was a bit of a house of cards situation. And uh, it culminated in what is famously known as the Watergate scandal. And now the, all the political scandals that happen now always end in gate, right? You always have gate stuff. There was Pizza Gate, if you know about that one. There was uh, actually Elon Musk had a scandal, and it was called Elon Gate, which was hilarious. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, that's true. That's actually a true story that actually happened. So, uh, but um, th through this controversy, through the Watergate scandal, um, Chuck Colson became a liability. Even though he had been dedicated and loyal to President Nixon, he became a real liability, so they cut him loose and sent him off. This is very, you know, in the world of politics, this is what happens a lot. And so he found himself out of the world of politics and back into the private sector. And uh, he gets a job and discovers that his new boss, Tom Phillips, had recently become a Christian. Actually, at a Billy Graham event. He'd, given his, he'd gone forward at a Billy Graham stadium and given his life to Christ. And so Tom Phillips is now telling Chuck Colson about his conversion experience to Christianity. And he says, if you ever want me to tell you my whole story, you know, come and see me. I'd love to share it with you. Well, the Watergate scandal kept growing, kept getting more and more serious. I think it was 1973 that they discovered the secret, the, the, the tape recordings of uh, President Nixon. And uh, before anyone heard what was on these tapes, it, it came to, to be known that we have these tapes now, the, the private conversations of the president in the, in the Oval Office and uh, his advisors. And Chuck Colson knew that he was on those tapes. And this was going to be exposed. So he went to see his new boss to kind of pour out his heart and to express his fears about the future, about what might happen, and the emptiness that he felt. And so uh, Tom started to share with him the gospel and started to open up the Bible and read scripture to him. Uh, but Chuck responded kind of a bit defensively and pushing back and trying to justify the actions he had taken, the nefarious actions behind the scenes that he had been involved in, trying to explain them away. And his boss stopped him and just pushed back on him and said, this sounds like pride. You're trying to justify these immoral things you've done. And Chuck was just overwhelmed in agony over the shame he felt about who he'd become and what, what he had done. Tom offered to pray for him, and as he prayed, Chuck felt something happen to him, but he couldn't explain. He didn't know what it was, and he was driving home, and as he's driving home, he was overwhelmed, and he started weeping uncontrollably, and he had to pull over the, on the side of the road, and in that moment, he repented of his sins and put his faith in Christ and became a, a believer, became a Christian in that moment, had a, a real kind of come-to-Jesus conversion experience, very powerful. The next day, he returned back to Washington, D.C., but the Watergate scandal kept growing and growing. Daily, there were new revelations hitting the headlines, coming out, and the pressure was building and building, and Chuck would wake up at night just absolutely fearful of the, the prospect of prison time, but also angry at the lies that the media was telling about him, things that weren't true. There were things that were true, but there were things, of course, in these situations that weren't true as well. He had been ruthless in his political career, and so now his political opponents were being no less kind to him, being ruthless with him. And because he was a, a high... Uh, a high-profile person, if he went to prison, his life was in danger. He'd be a high target for a lot of people in the prison system to attack him. And so the lawyers prosecuting the case used this as leverage against him. They offered him a plea bargain. And they said, if you plead guilty to the misdemeanor crime of conspiring to break into the offices of Daniel uh, Ellsberg's psychiatrist, which was part of the details of the Watergate scandal, if you will well, take this plead deal and plead guilty to this misdemeanor of conspiring to break into these offices, then you won't get any prison time. You're about to keep your law license. You'll be fine. Now, Chuck had done, had played many dirty tricks throughout his political career. 
But this charge that they were putting on him was not one of them. And so he faced this dilemma. As a new Christian, he had this option. Do I, do I save my own skin? Do I maintain my legal license so I can still practice law and provide for my family? And do I just save myself and kind of throw myself on this sword, as it were, to protect my own skin? What do I do in this situation? As a new believer, it didn't sit well with his conscience. He was becoming, beginning to become a man of authenticity, and so he rejected the plea bargain. Well, the lawyers instantly responded by slapping felony, uh, by indicting him with felony charges and threatening prison time, and then more of these tapes were being released. Tapes were coming out, and it was very public, and it revealed the deviousness and the dishonesty and the deception that was happening in the White House, and it was painful for Chuck Colson because he suddenly realized he had been part of all of that. He wasn't guilty of this misdemeanor crime that they were trying to pin on him. They're always trying to, they're trying to get to bigger people. Ultimately, they were trying to get to Nixon through it. They were always trying to fry you know, a bigger fish, as it were. Uh, but he knew he wasn't guilty of that, but he was guilty of other things. And he was totally disgraced and discredited. And he faced the real possibility of prison time and the threats to his own life, even in prison. I'm going to pause the story there. His story relates to our focus today in the passages of Scripture we're going to look at. I'll come back to the story at the conclusion of the sermon. So we're continuing our series today called Being the Church, and this series is designed to help us grapple with and help us think about how can we have a mature mindset and mature practices around building a genuine Christian community. How can it be done? And today, last week, we looked at the idea of being sheep shepherds. We've got to get this idea out of our minds that just the shepherds do everything, but actually, we're all called to participate. We're sheep shepherds. Uh, today, we're going to drill into the idea of being an authentic community. That's the, the title of today's sermon, is being an authentic community. The idea of how can we grow in being genuine about our faith and get past the temptation to appear a certain way, to actually work on the issues that we face and be authentic in that way. So let me say a prayer, and then we can, we can get into this. Lord, we do pray for your help today. Help your words shine brightly in our hearts. Holy Spirit, do an amazing work. Illuminate the word of Christ to us today, and help us understand this vision that you have for your family, for your community, that we would be those who seek to be authentic even in the face of the shame that that might bring, momentary shame, but that we would be those who are honest and genuine about our struggles and our need for each other and our need for you. God, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, it turns out nobody ever said, hey, I'd really like some more insincere people in my life. That'd just be what I really need, some more inauthentic people in my life. No one ever said that. In fact, uh, Genuine people, uh, trustworthy, likable. You know, we, we all like pref and preferred being around uh, people that we can trust, and uh, they're going to tell us the truth and not lie to us. And you know, on the flip side of that, right? If a church community um, is shallow and fake, um, one of the things that that leads to is we're trying to keep up our appearances, so we don't actually deal with the the personal issues we face or the challenges or the frustrations that we might have or the disagreements we might have between us or just our own, our own personal failings. We don't deal with those things. We actually are just, we, we, we pour an enormous amount of energy into just making things look like they're right rather than pouring that energy into actually making sure things are right. Last week, we established the idea that Christian communities, that God blesses us with overseers, right, with shepherds, with appointed pastors of churches, those who have leadership and authority, and that we're told to imitate our shepherds. We're told to look to them for guidance and to how to live, and that's the way God's kind of designed, one of the ways that God's designed the church to be, and that includes looking to imitate and to mimic an authentic life. We want to follow, we want to have confidence that we can follow people who have an authentic, sincere 
Christian faith. Now, no leader's perfect. We've got to understand that. We can't have unrealistic expectations, but we can still embody and seek to embody the positive godly traits that we see in the leaders that God raises up around us. And uh, in doing that, though, we've got to be careful that we don't mimic uh, bad dance moves and lame jokes, which uh, can be uh, common sometimes. Uh, <laughs> my daughter hates it when I make terrible jokes. Uh, so, 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, we've got this verse here, tells us uh, about the apostle Peter, or second, 1 Peter 5, tells us the, uh, verse 3, tells us, it says, church pastors are charged with being ex examples to the flock. And then the Apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So the idea here is that um, we need each other. We need um, to, you know, the goal, the ultimate goal is I've got to be like Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm here to imitate and mimic Jesus. But Jesus in this plan wants us to also look to each other. We help each other figure out what it means to be like Jesus by seeing it in each other. And you, know, you definitely know what it's not like when you're like, well, that person's not acting like Jesus. Uh, that's pretty obvious. Uh, but also, you need, we need those positive examples to say like, yeah, you know, that does seem quite Christ-like of that person. And that, man, that testimony, that example, that's powerful. That, that gives us a vision of how to do it. It gives us faith how to do it. The sun is shining through the windows, guys. Does that mean the rain has stopped? Has the rain stopped? I don't know. I see the sunlight. It's like a glorious... It makes me appreciate these stained glass windows, actually, um, even more. I like them, but, you know, sometimes. Anyway. <laughs> old stuff. It's just hard to maintain old stuff, like pews and stuff. It's just a headache. I just want to say that. Just going to put it out there. All right. Just trying to be authentic. Trying to be real to the <laughs> sermon topic today. God especially knows that we need figureheads in our lives. Without good role models and good examples to follow, we flounder around. We can't just look to ourselves. We can't just look in the mirror and say, I'm just a great role model for myself. It never works that way. You always have to have somebody to look to. Uh, now, as we do that, as we look to figureheads and those shepherding types, as we look to those people in our lives, we have to be really careful that we don't put those people on a pedestal, that we don't kind of turn into like hero worshipers, you know, where we're, we, we kind of elevate the person even above Christ, you know, the ultimate aim is to, to worship Jesus and to be like Jesus. But um, in, in our imitation of those around us that God uh, blesses us with, we also have to be wise to the issue of shepherds that, that want, to, want to get a lot of strokes to their own ego, who um, are self aggrandizing or drawing too much attention to themselves rather than to God. Because we want to better, if, you, if you're going to copy somebody's life, you want to better examine their life, which is why you know, the problem of celebrity leaders or leaders on, online or you know, on social media is you do, we don't know their lives. We have no idea if they're people of integrity. And, and they, you know, um, it's, so, in our culture, it's more, of a, it's more prized and more of a commodity, more of a skill to, to be able to present yourself a certain way, whether you're that way or not. That's what social media is all about, is presenting yourself in a certain way, whether you're that way or not. And it's, there's more energy and focus and interest in doing that than there is in actually being the way you should be. But we're called, we're here to be the way that Jesus actually wants us to be. And so one of the things I never hear anyone, I've never heard anyone preach on this, never heard anyone talk about this. One of the clear callings on shepherds, on pastors, is to willfully accept their role, to willfully accept it. And this is something that the sheep of the church, the, 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 the flock of the fold, this is something that we can imitate, that we should imitate in our leaders. So in uh, first, uh, Peter chapter 5 again, I think it was the verse, verse 2 this time, Apostle Peter writes this, he says, shepherd the flocks, so he's talking to the pastors, he says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. This, this is God's will. God wants... Leaders, God wants leaders to lead and to oversee, not under compulsion, but willingly. Now, if you do something, if you're, if you're compelled to do something, you do something under compulsion, that means that you are doing something that you don't want to do. Uh, you're being forced into it, manipulated into it, tricked into it somehow, pressured into it. Now, it's different to, don't confuse this with... Um, 
something like having your mind changed because sometimes we're persuaded. Sometimes we just didn't see something a certain way and we get persuaded and then our hearts actually change because we've got better reasons and we say, oh, I actually do want to do that. Right? That's not being compelled. That's being convinced. That's different. Um, there are also times where we need healthy pressure on us. We need healthy peer pressure where we might be tempted to do the wrong thing, but everyone around us is doing the right thing. And we need that, that accountability and that pressure to say, well, I, even though I want to do this because of the people around me, I'm not going to do it. We all need that too. That's not compulsion. That's different. Compulsion is whether it's external, there's external pressure on us, or we, we put pressure on ourselves. We compel ourselves to do something against our own will. When we enter into something with the wrong motives, the wrong heart, doing it for the wrong reasons. And so when we, as sheep of the fold, as, as God's flock, as we stand in the, the, the shoes, or I guess the sandals of, of shepherds, and we say, hey, I want to be a sheep shepherd, I want to be somebody who is care, caring for the flock together, we're being the church together, sharing the responsibilities of ministry. As, as I'm doing that, I've got to understand that this needs to be done willingly. God wants me to engage my will to voluntarily to know what I'm signing up for. But I'm not, not, not doing it with mixed motives or false motives or I'm being compelled or pressured into it. But I am of my own accord, honestly, saying, yeah, this is, these are my people. These are my people. And I'm here to be a part of these people. Now, um, something to illustrate this that helps us with this is the Bible's teaching on special offerings. A little, let me illustrate this, and we'll, we'll bring this uh, here full circle. But uh, a well-known passage, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, says this. 2 Corinthians 9, verses, uh, verse 7, it says, Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. There's the same word there, not under compulsion, being compelled. For God loves a cheerful giver. So, let me, let me illustrate this, uh, this idea through, through a special offering, that when you're engaged, when there's a chance to give in a sacrificial way to an offering, there shouldn't, you shouldn't be manipulated into it or pressured into it. You should choose in your own heart to participate in it because God wants that joy in your heart as you do it. Now, this is the context of this verse that we've looked at, we've got to understand, is separate to the Bible's idea of tithing. So just take a slight detour real quick on this. But uh, there's, there's two different kind of main ways of giving that the Bible describes to us. A tithe is, literally means tenth. That's our ongoing giving that we give to ministry. God calls us to pour that into his kingdom. That's a set percentage. No matter our, it's a scalable thing. No matter your income, you're giving that tithe. It goes first and foremost to God. All right, that's, that's commanded very clearly, taught throughout Scripture. So we do that. A special offering, which we're told, don't give under compulsion. There's no... What it's saying is it's saying there's no set percentage to give. There's no, it's not like, oh, you, in a special offering, you've got to give $100. Or in a special offering, you've got to give $500. Or in a special offering, you've got to give $2,000. There's, there's nothing like that. There's no like, oh, it's uh, 5% for a special offering. Nothing like that. It's between you and God. Nobody can set the amount. Nobody can force you into it. You have to decide in your heart. And the, the test in an offering to know that you have done it appropriately and properly is that there's joy on the other side. See, if you give in a stingy way, you give because you're like, well, everyone's giving, and it's a special offering, so I should give. But you give a very little amount, and you, you feel it afterwards. You don't have the joy because you're like, yeah, I really just failed on that one. Or if you give out of guilt or pressure, and you, you, you give more than you really want to, you know, again, I failed because I've gone beyond what I really felt my heart wanted to do or c could do. I, I, I was somehow pressured into it, and you see all kind of manipulative tactics, uh, unfortunately, in terms of uh, giving to things. That's why I always try to turn off K-Love, because of all the manipulations to give. I'm like, I don't like that. Uh, sorry, any K-Love uh, fans out there. Uh, apart from that, hey, super encouraging, you know. Um, <laughs> so if you don't know what K-Love is, don't worry about it. Uh, where did I get to? So bringing it full circle, the idea of a special offering we're not supposed to give under compulsion, not supposed to give under manipulation, or, or reluctantly apply that to shepherding the flock. Apply that to being a sheep shepherd, somebody who's engaged in church community. I shouldn't be doing this out of a sense of obligation. I shouldn't be here because, oh, I, you know, well, isn't that the right thing to do? Or 
isn't that what these people think? Or what if people, aren't people going to judge me for what I do or don't do? It shouldn't be any, anything like we need to get, get rid of all of those, those reasons. We need, to, we need to understand, if I'm struggling to give my heart, if I'm, if I'm reluctant, doing it under some kind of compulsion, some kind of force that's against my will, it's probably because I haven't had this moment that shepherds have where they voluntarily sign up and say, I'm all in it for the sheep. I'm going to do whatever it takes to protect the sheep from predators, from getting from one spot to another spot, feeding them properly, helping them lay down in green pastures and restoring them, feeding them. That's what has to happen for anyone taking on. And a lot of people get into full-time ministry without, you know, properly taking stock of this even, of, of having this kind of come to Jesus moment. Like there's a moment of conversion, like Chuck Colson in our story that we began with. Um, some people, if you've been around in, in the Christian faith for a long time, you've grown up with it, you may not be able to pinpoint the moment that, that you uh, became a believer, but uh, God knows that. God's in charge of all that. He figures all that out. But you, you, you know you are. There was a moment, you know, there, there are still moments where we know my faith is my own. It's real. I believe. I've decided to, you know, there are those moments in our life when you can have ups and downs with that. But just like you have a, a conversion salvation moment, there is a sense in which you kind of need to have a conversion to the church as well. Well, you have to, and a lot of Christians don't get this. This is why Christians float around churches. Because they, because we don't realize I have to willingly, not under compulsion, not under manipulation, not because I think I should or because I'm, I'm forcing myself or someone else is forcing me to do it, but I am all in on this church thing because Jesus died to build his church. His blood was shed to build a family together. And it's not about my comfort and what I want to get out of it or just meeting my needs. I'm here to be a blessing to other people. I'm, I've got that shepherding, whatever it takes to help the sheep, to help the flock be okay, whatever it takes. You know, I think that that's an authentic faith. That's an authentic experience of, of church community. And I think that authenticity is tied to happiness, actually. I think there's a direct connection between those, those things. That the, the, the more insincere and inauthentic we are, I think the less happy we are, which is, I think, social media proves that uh, in large amount. There's also reasons we might be unhappy. You know, we can be depressed about things. We can be discouraged, disillusioned about things. You know, all kind of different things we can struggle with that can make us unhappy. But I think one thing we underestimate or overlook is the idea that if we violate our own wills, that we live in discord, we live in a disconnect, an imbalance between what God has called us into and what our hearts actually want, or we've got a divided heart, if we live in a lack of harmony between those two things, we're going to struggle with joy. I think, you know, the most, most miserable Christians are the ones who are trying to keep a foot in the world still and still keep a foot in God's kingdom. Like, I want to get the best of both worlds, and the problem is you get the worst of both in that situation. It's horrible. It's a horrible place to live in because you're, like, trying to get the world as much as you can, but then when you're in church, you're like, I feel terrible for doing this. And then when you're in the world, you're like, well, I, you know, what are my church going to think? And what are Christians going to think? Or what's God going to, most importantly, what's God going to think? You know, we're living in this awful disconnect, and because we're violating our own consciences, there's this divided will in our own hearts. Uh, there's, there's terrible outcomes in having a divided will. Uh, the brother of Jesus, James, in James chapter 4, he says this, James 4, verse 1, he says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? This is the human problem, right? We, we want good things. Yeah, we, we can want a lot of good things. But you know what? We also want things that are wrong. Things that are destructive to us. Things that are going to harm us. Temporary pleasures. Not the true joys of God, but temporary things. But then they're destructive to us. We, our passions can be at war within us. And, and, you know, frankly, an inauthentic life, an insincere life, a life that's warring between these competing desires is a sad life. Because we can never, you can only have, Jesus said it so many times, you can only serve one master. You can only have one Lord. And that's Jesus. And Jesus has come to build his church. And the only way to solve this problem is, the worst thing we can do is to say, well, I'm just, uh, 
going to give up on other Christians and give up on church community. That would be the worst thing we could do. Say, well, that, wouldn't that be more authentic? Maybe, but that's not going to be good for you. The only response is this. I've got to figure out how to get my heart aligned with God and God's plan for his people. I've got to bring my heart in alignment with what he's calling me into, willfully giving myself, as a shepherd does, willfully, not under compulsion, not with reluctance, but of my own volition saying, I've signed up for this. This is what it's all about. I'm all in with this. Let's look at some signs of insincerity here. I've got 11 signs. We'll try and drill through these real quick. Number one, arrogance. So shepherds are, so talking about, we're mimicking shepherds. Shepherds are not to be arrogant. That's Titus 1.7. Arrogance is thinking of ourselves too highly. Number two, self-praise. Let another praise you and not your own mouth. So when, you know, when we list off our accomplishments, our successes, or our qualifications, we sound vain. It's like walking up to a group of people and being like, hey guys, how's it going? High five. <laughs> right? That felt awkward. I just got to say, that felt super awkward doing that. So in a real situation, and that's, yeah, self-praise is a self-high five. Number three, flattery. We should, uh, we should not use words of flattery. False praise uh, can get a short-term result, but in the long term, it can destroy relationships. Number four, recognition. Good work should not be motivated by recognition. So beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Number five, self-righteousness. Uh, we should not think we are automatically right. The ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. So humility is the truest form of honesty. Number six, hypocrisy, having standards that we, that we don't follow. So Scripture says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Number seven, greed. Shepherds are not to be greedy for gain. So greed exposes our underlying motivations, right? Gaining profit should never outweigh gaining trust. This is a big problem in certain sectors of the Christian world, right? Is a lot of ministries are built around leaders enriching themselves, other people enriching themselves. And sadly, so many Christians fall for it. Number, number eight is immorality. Shepherds should be lovers of good. So if we use poor language or we justify cheating or lying or stealing or we excuse minor wrongs, we love evil instead. That's immoral. Number, number nine, that's inauthentic. Injustice, we're called to do justice. If we excuse, celebrate, or commit any form of injustice, it reveals an insincere faith. Our heart has weighted scales. This is the idea in the Bible of you're not supposed to carry uh, weights with you that are made of different types of metal because when you're trying to weigh out how much something is worth, if you use a fake weight, uh, you're deceiving, you're doing an act of injustice. Number 10, rivalry. So we're warned uh, not to do things out of rivalry and selfish ambition, but sincerely. So it's strange, but even ministry can turn into a competition. Uh, number 11, lastly here, uh, is appeasing people. It's sometimes easier to people please instead of doing the right thing. We speak not to please man, but to please God. These are all some signs looking across Scripture, signs that indicate to us, oh boy, I'm being inauthentic. I'm being insincere in my faith. What's the response to this? It's to confess. Confession is at the heart of the Christian faith. That's the entry point, that, that humility of the heart to confess our faults. That's the only way to be truly... See, sometimes we think it's to, be, to be authentic is to show, well, shouldn't my life match my, my faith or shouldn't my life match my beliefs? And so we think it's inauthentic if we actually reveal our shortcomings. But that's, that's the wrong way around, that actually... Um, the only way to be authentic is to voice our shortcomings and our failings. And so, but it's not just to confess. Yes, confess, confession is part of it. We've got to confess even our worst sins, you know, things like watching The Bachelor or The Real Housewives or, you know, some of the worst stuff that we can get involved in. Uh, but it's, it's also, see, the problem is that we don't even see our shortcomings sometimes. That's the beauty of being part of a church community, being part of God's family, is that we need each other as mirrors, a church community acts as mirrors. You, you see yourself more clearly that you realize, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I was pointing this out to somebody the other day. But if, you, if you're impatient, the only way to become more patient is to be around people that make you feel impatient. There is no other way to grow in kindness. The only way to be more kind is to be around people 
who it's hard to be kind towards. Because, you know, if, if, it's, if there's somebody that's easy to be kind towards, that's not really a test. Because it's easy. It's the person who is ungrateful, unwilling, difficult to talk to, difficult to listen to, showing kindness to that person. That's the test. That's the real test. This uh, became true in my life, I think, um, Several years ago now, a pastor friend of mine recommended uh, that I read the book uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Pete Scazzaro. And that book's all about, it's a Christian book, it's all about how God has given us our emotions. It's all about emotional health from a Christian perspective and looking at that from a scriptural standpoint as well and looking at the emotions in God and the emotions in the scripture and understanding that we're not our emotions and we're not to be ruled by our, our emotions, but God is a person a being of emotion, and he's given us emotions, and that they teach us something. They reveal to us what's going on in us and what's going on in other people, and the key is to pay attention to them. They, they, they shouldn't define who we are. We don't just give in to them, but we have to see them because they tell us something. God, is, God communicates to us as we understand our emotions. So I, my pastor friend recommended this book, so I read it, but I read it with a bit of a leadership lens. So I was like, oh yeah, I can be a better leader by being more emotionally healthy, and I'm going to try and pay attention to what I, what's going on in me and other people. This is great. Yeah, I've got another tool in my tool belt here for being a leader and being a more mature Christian. Like, that's great. And then my wife read the book, and she said, she came to me and said, why aren't we talking about this? <laughs> like, and I was like, oh dear, what did I miss? So that conversation led us uh, then to reading that together and going much deeper, and then eventually to getting some Christian counseling as well, and going even deeper into these things, and, you know, I, I needed that. I, I thought, I, I read it, and I thought, I get it. Yeah, it's great. I understand it, but I didn't get it. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see it. I couldn't see it. It took my, so initially took my friend saying, you should read this book. Great, got it, going to read the book. Then it took my wife being like, we, we need to read this together and actually talk about it. Like, okay, I missed that too. Let's do that. Let's go back to square one. It's always painful, painful. Learn the lesson. You always have to be willing to go back to square, to step one. You have to be willing. You always have to be willing. No matter what happens in your life, no matter what you lose or how far along you think you are, you always have to be willing to go all the way back to the first step and say, I've missed something. How do I walk this path again? But then ultimately, also, we needed a counselor. We needed after somebody who was trained in these things to kind of work it through with and talk to. And we need each other for this stuff, you know? Um, this is the outcome of the outcome of ministry is that we're supposed to have a sincere heart, sincere faith. Paul talks about this. He writes to Timothy, and he, the apostle Paul's writing to Timothy, and he's saying, like, hey, you know, this is the, the, the goal that we have, that we're, we're supposed to produce genuine love in the church, in Christians. They're supposed to, we're supposed to be people of real love, and that means not just with words, not just say loving things or talk about loving people, but Acts of love. That's what love really is. Love is sacrificial. That's what the true nature of love is. I give up something to help you in some way. It's easy to do something if it doesn't cost you anything. That's, that's not a real test of love. The real test of love is it costs me something to do it. So Paul writes this in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. He says, the aim of our charge, that means like our teaching, our ministry, everything that we're doing, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. The temptation for the religious, for people who think they understand the, the law of God and the ways of God, is to be very confident about all kinds of different things. And people get bamboozled by confidence. Confidence if you see a confident person or you're a confident person, praise God for that. You can use that for God's glory, but don't be fooled by it. Because confidence is, is um, separate from what is right and what is wrong. <laughs> uh, they don't always go together. But we can be bamboozled by charismatic, confident people. Um, the temptation for religious people, for people who have a spiritual perspective, especially those of us who want to follow Jesus, is such a temptation to talk about love and to theorize about love, and to talk about these Christian values that we have, but to not actually show love. To not actually pour our lives out for each other and for this world. We're always pontificating about it, but never actually doing it. But a sincere faith will be shown in actions. 
it's a challenging question, but you know, we can ask ourselves, and we can ask this about each other, but what acts of love are there in our lives? Can you think of acts of love? If there aren't many, or there aren't any, that needs to be a real question mark about, well, what's the sincerity of my faith all about? How deep is my faith? How do we grow in being authentic? Well, the great news is, is uh, you don't have to do anything. That sounds wrong, doesn't it? Don't have to do something? Well, kind of, but you don't have, God's already started the process is what I'm trying to say, is that God has already enrolled us in a training program. God's enrolled us in this training program. It's called Life and, and church as well. Church is a training program. Actually, church is even better. I mean, all of life has, you know, things in it that God's using to train us and to test us and to produce growth in us. He's doing all of that. But church is like, that's like that. On, it's like the training program on steroids. If you want to accelerate your spiritual growth, get involved in a church. It'll test you. It'll make you angry. It'll make you mad. It'll depress you sometimes. There is no other way to be like Jesus, to become like the shepherd, to mimic the shepherd, than to get involved. In fact, God, he does some peculiar things. So in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, God exposed them on purpose to false prophets in order to test them. So we read this in Deuteronomy 13. Nope. Oh, that's my bad. Um, Thank you. Actually, go back to that quote. I missed a quote. <laughs> go back to the quote. Jump back. Coretta Scott King, the wife of Martin Luther King Jr., says this, the greatness of community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? The greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. Now let's go to Deuteronomy uh, 13, verse 3. It says, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So God intentionally exposes us to false prophets, false teachers, and for the people of Israel, God even says they're going to do false signs and wonders. So not only are these people teaching things that sound attractive and sound kind of right, but they're, they're going to draw your heart into idolatry. They're going to ultimately draw you away to worshiping a false god. Not only that, but they're going to have supernatural, powerful signs to validate their teachings and their prophecies. Now, that's a test. God intentionally exposes believers to false teachers, false prophets who have false power and can do pretty amazing things and can be super uber confident about stuff. And it's a test on our hearts. Can we see, can we discern that the outcome of that ministry is actually drawing away true worship from God? Can we see that? It's a test. Is, is the result, the fruit of a voice that I listen to or some teaching I get from somebody, is it alluring and causing me to lust after being wealthy or like the prosperity gospel or being recognized or just being great in my own eyes or that God's got some you know, plan for me to be rich and famous somehow? Like, Is that what I'm feeding myself on? That kind of false message. Or what about the kind of the message that has a, the guise of Christianity to it, but actually it leans on academic ideologies above God's word. The people, it kind of sounds Christian-y, it kind of sounds right, but actually there are academic ideas that are actually kind of denying God's truth and God's word. And have I fallen for it? Is it causing me to gravitate more towards those things than having an authentic faith and actually trusting God in that situation? So there's, there's false prophets and false teachers and false teachings that God exposes us to, but God also exposes us to trials and to tests. James chapter 4, again, James chapter 1, I, I think it is, verses 2 through 4, says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God orchestrates everything in our lives to produce something in our character. You know you've reached the next level of maturity, and you know that God's producing endurance in you when you respond to the troubles of life 
Instead of saying, I'm so angry with God, or why has God done this to me, or how could this happen, or it's the devil. Instead of always responding with some of those things, sometimes it is the devil, the bigger question that we ask, and this is a higher level of maturity, higher level of awareness, is what is God teaching me through this? The gap between trial and me asking that question is the measurement of maturity. That's what it comes down to. You know you've reached the next level, the next plane, the next stage of growth, when the things in your life that go awry, that go wrong, you ask this question. Okay, God is up to something. God is doing something. What is he doing? And then when we fail, when we don't ask that question, or we fail the tests and the trials, we keep tripping up over and over and over again, when, when that keeps happening to us, even that, in God's grace, in God's kindness, is an opportunity for us to pour ourselves out on God. God can even use that to redeem us. So I think in James uh, chapter 4, again, it tells us uh, this, this next verse here. Any second now. We go to the bathroom. James 4, verse 8 through 10. It says, uh, uh, James, the brother of John, says this, says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. That's not very nice. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's not very nice. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Well, hang on a second. I thought Christianity was always about being happy and smiley and just being positive all the time. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Wait, this sounds opposite. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Even in our failings, what you do is you embrace the turmoil. You embrace your own failure and you bring it to God and you cry out for God's help because God's, see, he calls us from a distance. He doesn't wait for us to get our lives in order and for us to be all clean and neat and tidy and be, have everything perfect. Far from it. When we're far away, when we're the most screwed up, the most messed up, God is calling out to us with chance after chance after chance, calling us to him. And isn't that a giant reminder of how much God loves us and how much he wants to be close to us? He wants to be with us. He gives us chance after chance after chance after chance. And even in our worst failings, you know what we do is we, we collapse in humble lament and weeping, pull over to the side of the road, whatever it takes, and we say, I'm all yours, God, I need you. I failed again and again and again and again. I'm in the depths of despair. I failed again. And you understand that no failure we could ever commit. We cannot outfail God's grace. It is impossible. It's impossible to outfail God's grace. The apostle Paul, he, he, he shows us the heart of God in this and how you know, we're, we're afraid to confess to each other, what will people think of me if they know the worst things about me? Or what will God think of me? Or we, we, but Paul's so gentle in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, he says this about the Thessalonian Christians. He says, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. This is the heart of Christian ministry right here. This is how we relate to each other. There's no greater bond. I love this image. You know, the, a, a nursing mother. You know, a, a, an infant can be screaming, wailing, having a hard time latching on or, you know, thrashing around or biting or whatever it might be. And it takes, you know, even with the sleeplessness of it and the stress of it and the difficulty of it, all the mums know uh, what I'm talking about, the challenges of all that. The love... And the care that a mother has for her child in that, that moment, even though you say, I really want to shake this baby right now. You're like, I'm not going to shake the baby. I need to love the baby. And you understand why people shake babies, right? If you haven't had a baby, you don't know. But once you have a baby, you understand why people do it. Don't do it. We're not going to do it. But, but, but that's, that's the heart of God. And that needs, to be, that needs to be the shepherding heart towards each other is that even in moments of confrontation, even in moments where it's like we've got to have some tough love for each other. We've got to call each other out on things and hold each other to the standard of Christ. Even in that, there's got to be gentleness. It's got to be with this, this spirit, this tenderness, saying I've got this shepherding heart to pour out. So we've got to ask God, God, test my heart. Reveal to me any part of me that's divided, any part of me that is insincere, that is inauthentic. Root it out of me. Get it out of me. Now what happened with our brother in Christ, Chuck Colson? Well, Chuck decided to go the authentic route. If you didn't want to miss the, uh, the, the introductory story, the conclusion, then tune back in right now. 
Chubb decided to go the authentic route. And he voluntarily, he decided to voluntarily confess to a crime he had committed instead of confessing to this trumped up charge that he was facing. He, and every, everyone thought this was insane. His lawyers were mad at him. Absolutely mad at him. His wife was questioning it. His whole family questioned it. Everyone was like, this is insane. Don't do this. But Chuck knew he had to start putting God first. He had to start expressing a sincere faith. In a trial, you normally, you get prosecuted for something, and you normally plead guilty or not guilty to those charges. In this case, and this is the only case I know of where this has happened. Maybe it's happened other times. Instead of confessing guilty or not guilty, Chuck Colson's lawyer had to say, my client pleads guilty to a different charge. And he decided to plead guilty to leaking, um, defaming, you know, uh, defaming uh, basically information about this guy, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, that they, he leaked to the press. Um, that was uh, a def- could have been a defamation suit, I guess. And so he confessed to that crime, making up this derogatory story and leaking it to the press. That was his crime. And he hoped that in confessing this, that the judge would go easy on him. The, the judge would realize, like, okay, this guy's probably telling the truth. Uh, this is a very strange thing to do. Well, it didn't work that way. The judge took no mercy, sentenced him one to three years in prison. And in July 1974, Chuck Colson was incarcerated. He had gone from the White House to the courthouse to the jailhouse. But through it all, he saw that God was doing something. God had humbled him. He had been a very arrogant, very self-centered, ruthless person, and God had brought him to the lowest place he'd ever been. And he brought him to these inmates, to this new community that he found. And he realized, God has brought me here to love these people, and to shepherd these people. And instead of losing his life, he found his calling. And he started using his legal prowess and his legal abilities to start helping other inmates get early releases. He started telling them how the justice system works and how they can get out of jail sooner. And he started doing prayer times and Bible studies and sharing his faith and leading fellow inmates to Christ, and God protected him. His whole time in prison, God protected him. When he was finally released, Chuck Colson, having lost his ability to practice law, he dedicated his life to prisoners. He started a, a program, Christian program, called uh, prison, prison Outreach, and they help with rehabilitating former inmates and going into the prison system. And He left this amazing legacy in this regard. He passed away in 2012. And a man who fell from such grace, who was a really rotten person, God took him through these circumstances and produced a man that was worthy to follow. And he left behind this legacy of faith and this legacy of cultural change and cultural impact. And also, he left behind compassion for those in prison whether people were there justly or unjustly, whether their sentences were right or wrong. He left that deposit in the Christian world towards those in prison. And in his steps, in his legacy, today, we're living out that same calling. We're walking in that same pathway. We're partnering with a very similar ministry, Chicago Land Prison Outreach. And we're joining together as a shepherding community, as God's family, joining together together. To care, we care for each other, we shine the light together, but we're also caring for the least in society, the forgotten, the, the ignored, the lost, those who are most lost in some regard, who have found themselves in that place. We're saying, let's put a spotlight on them, let's care for them, let's love them and reach out for them, because spiritually that's what God has done for us in Christ. And we can do this, and we can express this heart because we have a Savior who expressed his grace to us, who expressed his heart to us, who willingly accepted his role. In the garden before his trial and crucifixion, he said, if there's any way I can get out of this, paraphrasing, right? If you could take this cup from me, take it from me, but not my will. See, not my will. That's that. His will became not his will. That's what it is to be a Christian. That's what it is to to stand in the sandals of a shepherd. 
is to say, I willfully accept, voluntarily accept the mission that God has to build his church. And in Jesus, we have somebody who willingly gave himself up for his mission. He was given a mission and he accepted it. And his mission was to die. That's the hardest mission. That's why we should respect anyone willing to go into battle to protect others. Jesus says, it, you know, no greater love is this than a man lays down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus, Jesus calls us friends. And he laid his life down. He died in our place to secure our salvation, to set us free. That's the greatest joy. That's the greatest delight. That's the greatest truth that you could ever hear. That's what we need to live on. That's what we need to take into the world every day. That's what we need to be the church. There's only, there's only one way to be the church, is to live off of that foundation. We need to respond. We need to sing to Jesus. We need to turn our hearts to him. We're going to collect in that Connect card that you have, and that offering envelope you have. If you didn't get a chance, please go ahead and fill this out. On the back, there are some steps here. You can write down a prayer request as well. And please stick around. We've got small group sign-ups in the lobby after service. Get in a small group. This church community, you've got to do more than just Sunday. You've got to get in a group. But stick around to eat some hot dogs, right? Uh, even if you're a vegetarian, just take one day off and uh, <laughs> just eat a bun. There's toppings you can eat. Um, stick around. Do something important today uh, with your time and uh, get to know us. And uh, we hope we can be a blessing to you today. When you like and subscribe, this video reaches more people.